Hey everyone, my name is Austin, and I'm so glad that you decided to watch our River Valley Rogue River sermon. We are a church located in the beautiful city of Rogue River, and we would love to connect with any and all of you. One of the best ways you can do that is by joining our Facebook page. You can type in River Valley Rogue River, and you can join our page. Another way to do that is by sending direct emails. If you want to be in contact, if you need any prayer, make sure to reach out. We would love to get in contact with you. We hope that this sermon blesses you. Have a great rest of your day. Well, good morning, guys. How's everybody doing today? We doing good? Let's do this. Thumbs up, middle, or down? How are we doing? Okay, a lot of thumbs up. A, lot of, a few middle. All right, all right. Two thumbs up, Shauna. <laughs> Booyah. That's what I like to see. That's great. Well, hey, guys, I'm glad you're here today. I want to introduce myself. Uh, my name's Austin. I'm, I'm one of the pastors here. Uh, before we get rolling, we do want to kind of do some quick housekeeping. Uh, on your way in, you probably received a uh, bulletin. It's a little bit thicker than we normally have. Uh, on that bulletin, there's a barcode. Uh, that barcode is there for two particular reasons, two benefits. If you want to find the benefits of that barcode, the way you get it is by pulling your cell phone out and scanning it. Um, sometimes you guys see that you, you go to a restaurant, and you got to get the menu or whatever, you scan the barcode, and it pops up the menu. Uh, we're kind of trying that out. You're wondering, ah, I don't really know if I want to scan the barcode. That's okay. Here's where the barcode takes you. It basically takes you to our Connect card. So the reason we are trying to get people to scan the barcode and go to the page it takes you to and to fill out the connect card is because right now we're in the process of doing a roster update. We don't normally update our roster that often. It happens very rarely, uh, but today is one of those Sundays. And so if you attend our church, if you're a part of our body, we ask that you fill out a connect card, you scan the barcode, you fill out whatever it is, and we get your information. Uh, at the very minimum, we just ask for a name and a phone number. That's really it, or an email address. Uh, and, and the reason we do this is just to try to stay in contact with you, just to, so we can stay together as a body. And so uh, that's the first reason that we are having this today is to update our roster. But the second reason is actually much more important. It is because today is the first week of life group signups. So if you're not familiar with our church, uh, River Valley is a church that is made up of multiple different campuses, but even more important than that is our life groups. Uh, we really believe in life groups. We believe that life groups is actually a more accurate representation of what the church in the early book of Acts looks like than what we're doing here today. So life groups are a huge, huge, huge thing for us. And we want everybody to be plugged into a life group. And so if you're filling out our Connect card or filling out this, there's a little tab that you can press or you can cross and say life groups. And uh, you can turn it in, upload it, whatever, and we'll reach out to you and we'll uh, make sure that you find a group that is really good for your family, that's good for you, nice time of the week. We have many here in Rogue River and a lot that are taking place all across Southern Oregon. Uh, I think we have one over in Central Point. We have a few over in Sunny Valley. They're, they're all over. So um, go ahead and fill that out and uh, get it updated. When you're done with it at the end of service, if you want to drop it off in the offering box, which is hanging in the back, that would be awesome. So uh, that's a little bit of housekeeping. But now let's get into the text. This is going to be really, really fun. Um, so if you have your Bible, which I hope you do, go ahead and open it up. Turn to Philippians chapter 4. Philippians chapter four, Philippians chapter four, starting in verse one. The past few months, we as a church have been studying through the book of Philippians. We've titled this series, Joyride, and it has been a journey through this small but punchy book called Philippians. I know that I've enjoyed teaching through this series, and I hope you've enjoyed it as well. Uh, but today takes us to the very last chapter in Philippians. We're getting to the end. And today, we're talking about a subject that's pretty touchy, a subject that maybe some of us are really uncomfortable with, a subject that creeps us out. It is the idea of conflict, conflict. Now, for many of us, we don't like conflict. We avoid conflict like the plague. We hate it. Conflict is something that makes us queasy. We want to run away from it, and we don't want any part of it. We hate conflict. 
But then maybe there's others of us who don't necessarily hate conflict, but we actually enjoy it. Maybe we thrive off of conflict. It's not like the plague to us. It's like an all-you-can-eat buffet. We need conflict in our lives to stay going. We need it in our lives to stay moving. We love, love, love conflict. I remember when I was in high school, and some of you will be able to relate to this, there were certain people in the class that were drama kings and drama queens. They loved being in the middle of drama. They loved finding that salacious piece of information and then holding it over people's heads and being in the center of the gossip or the center of the conflict. You see, unfortunately, I think a lot of those drama kings and drama kings have actually grown up and still exist today. Maybe some of us are those people. You see, the problem is, and the unfortunate part is, is that conflict still remains in the Christian community. Just because you're a Christian or just because you're a part of the church does not mean that you are immune from conflict. Conflict happens in the church all the time. It'd be a flat out lie to say, become a Christian and you won't have any conflict in your life. In fact, how many of you right now, if you're a Christian in this room, can raise your hand and say, I've never been in the middle of conflict? No, every single one of us, our hand is down because conflict is in our life. We can't escape it. In fact, something that I've learned over the past six years of pastoral ministry is that Christians have sharp teeth. What do I mean by that? Well, here's what I mean. I always wanted a shirt, I don't know, maybe it could happen, a shirt that says, sheep bite. (laughs) Christians are pretty brutal at times. Christians will say things that are not really honoring to Christ, things that are pretty hurtful, things that are difficult to digest. Conflict is inevitable. It happens all the time. Now, the good news is that conflict is not a new thing in the church. The reason we know that is because conflict was actually taking place in the early church at Philippi. And we're going to see what this conflict looked like, and then we're going to see kind of how we can get through the conflict. And so as we look at Philippians chapter 4, starting in verse 1, we're going to look at what Christian conflict looks like in the church. So here's what we're going to do. We're going to start with verse 1, and then we're going to read all the way down to verse 5. We're going to take a chunk of scripture up front, then we're going to circle back and go verse by verse like we normally do. So here we go. Starting in verse 1. Here it is. So then, my dearly loved and longed for brothers and sisters, my joy and my crown. In this manner, stand firm in the Lord. Dear friends, I urge Iodia and I urge Syntyche to agree in the Lord. Yes, I also ask you, true partner, to help these women who have contended for the gospel at my side, along with Clement and the rest of my co-workers whose names are in the book of life. Rejoice in the Lord always. I will say it again, rejoice. Let your graciousness be known to everyone. The Lord is near. So what is happening in Philippians 4? Well, based on verse 1, what we know is that Paul really loved and really cared for the people in Philippi. Now, we've talked about this before. We've talked about how Paul loved these people, but I want to highlight it again because it's very important. Don't forget that when Paul was writing this letter to the church in Philippi, he was not in a town over, living the high life, sitting on a beach, drinking a Mai Tai. This dude was locked up in prison hundreds of miles away in the city of Rome with the very real chance that he could be put to death. And so when he's writing this letter to them, he is saying, I love you guys. I care about you. I cherish you. I miss the times that we would have barbecues and potlucks after we gathered. I miss the times where we would stay up late at night talking about our families and talking about work things. I miss being able to do the things that the church does together. In fact, we know that he really missed and loved them because of the word that he chooses to use in the Greek for the word longed. It's a pretty cool word. In fact, it's only used one time in the entire Bible. Friends, when a Greek word is only used one time in the entire Bible, it's there for a reason. It's there strategically. And to be honest with you, this is normally the time when we have a fun Greek word. We all say it together in our guttural German voices, but I couldn't pronounce it myself, so I just thought it would be kind of unfair to have us say it. It would just sound like gobbledygook, so I figured we're just going to plug along. But here's what Paul is saying when he says that I long for you guys. It is the idea of his heart aching. It is the idea of him longing to be with them. It's the idea of, imagine that all of your friends, all of your closest friends, the people that you love the most, 
Imagine that everybody, including yourself, booked an all-inclusive vacation to the white, sandy shores of Bora Bora, and you are looking forward to it. You're like, man, I cannot wait to be in Bora Bora, the sunshine. It's going to be a beautiful time. We're going to be there for 10 days, all-inclusive, fresh fruit, coconuts and pineapples. Ooh la la, this is awesome. But then right before you go, you take a COVID test. Eh, you can't go, but everybody else can. When Paul says that he's longing for them, it's the kind of longing that you would have having to stay home here in Southern Oregon, breathing in smoke while all of your friends are in Bora Bora sipping on Mai Tais. It's the, man, I wish I was there. Man, I wish I was with you guys. Man, I so desperately long to be with you So in this first verse, he is pointing out, I love you, I long for you, I wanna be next to you, I want to experience the joy in your church. I wanna experience that. Now, why do I share all this? Well, here's why. I find it particularly fascinating that in a passage all about conflict, Paul begins the discussion by reminding the people how much he loves them. Isn't that fascinating? In a passage all about conflict, how does Paul lead? I love you. I long for you guys. I cherish you. I think it's fascinating that before the disagreement and conflict is brought up, Paul says, hey, we're all on the same team, guys. We're all on the same team. Something that Maddie and I do frequently in our marriage when we argue or when we disagree with each other. And to be honest with you, it's only been about four times, give or take 72, but (laughs) but very rare, very rare, very rare. But most of the time when we're in the middle of a disagreement, in the middle of a discussion, inevitably what we will do is stop the discussion right before the temperature starts to get really hot and we'll look at each other and we'll say, we're on the same team. We're on the same team. Sure, she might hate me at that moment. She might be saying, you are way too logical. You don't have a single feeling in your body, you stoic dirtbag. She might be thinking that. I might be thinking, you emotional hemophiliac, like you're freaking out right now, like I don't know what's going on, but you, 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 you know, crazy disagreement, not good. But in that moment, we both come together and say, no, 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 we're the abbots. We might disagree, The temperature might be getting hot, but guess what? We are the abbots. And we're not gonna be shaken from that reality. This is what Paul's doing. He's leading this discussion by saying, we are on the same team. Sure, we might disagree, but right now we must remember that we are the church, that we are God's people He leads with love and unity because he wants the people in Philippi to see that if we are united at the foundation of our beliefs, let the earth shake because we're not gonna budge. We're not gonna be swayed. We're gonna remain strong. Look at what he says at the end of verse one. He says, in this manner, stand firm in the Lord. That should sound familiar to you if you've been here through our study of the book of Philippians. That phrase, stand firm, should ring a bell. That word there, stand firm, is the Greek word steko. You guys remember that one? Nod your head if you remember steko. Some of you remember steko. What is steko? Steko is the word that the general would yell out to his men right before the enemy would charge at them. It's the word that he would say to the shoulder, to shoulder, to shoulder soldiers, don't budge. Stand firm. You are one team. You are unified. You're not gonna budge. You're not gonna be pushed back. We are in this together. We are united. We are one team. Steko. We're united. Friends, this is a great principle to remember when it comes to dealing with conflict with other Christians. If you're taking notes, I suggest that you write this down. When it comes to dealing with conflict with Christians, we must always lead with the foundation of unity. Lead with the foundation of unity. We are united in the Lord. We're together on this. 
We are united as God's people. And I love and I appreciate that Paul starts out this discussion by reminding everyone in Philippi that we are Christians, first and foremost. We love each other and we're unified with each other. Does that mean we agree on everything? Absolutely not. But we are God's people, unified, not shaken, standing firm in the Lord, stecho, standing firm. Look at verse two. This is where Paul really kind of dives in. He says this, I urge Eodia and I urge Syntyche to agree in the Lord. Now, who is Eodia? Who is Syntyche? Well, let's look at verse three and we'll see. He says, yes, I also ask you, true partner, to help these women who have contended for the gospel at my side. So Eodia and Syntyche are two women that are evidently leaders in the church at Philippi. These are two women that have worked side by side with Paul. They were ambassadors of the gospel. They were Christian leaders. They both loved Jesus and they both fought and defended the gospel with Paul. Now, to be honest with you guys, that's really all we know. That's really it. That's all we know about these two women. In fact, we don't even know what they're arguing about. How interesting is that? We don't even know what the conflict is. Now, that's pretty important. And and the reason that is important is because it shows us something about the nature of this disagreement. This is very important. Listen closely. It shows us that Yodia and Syntyche were fighting about something relational and not theological. Or in other words, it wasn't this big theological disagreement that they hated each other about. No, it was something relational. You say, Austin, you're reading into the text too much. How do you know that? Well, here's how. Because all throughout Paul's epistles, Paul does a very good job of attacking heresy, theological problems head on. All throughout his epistles, he addresses issues like circumcision or baptism or headship, authority, and many other disputes that are going on in the church, even calling out people by name, saying, don't follow this person. This person is wicked. But here in Philippians 4, he doesn't do that. He doesn't bring up any particular issue. Instead, he points out that the problem is disunity and distraction. The problem is disunity and distraction. I'm going to say this about 17 times. The problem is disunity and distraction. The problem is disunity and distraction. The problem, say it with me, is disunity and distraction. I'm going to say it one more time. The problem is disunity and distraction. Now, the reason I'm repeating disunity and distraction so many times is because don't you think disunity and distraction is a problem for us? Don't you think that disunity and distraction is the same problem that is plaguing the church today? You better believe it, that disunity and distraction are still a problem today in the church, just like they were back in Philippians 4. The most clear and obvious example of this is the C word, COVID. COVID. You guys know what's going on right now, right? Many of us in here are going through an incredibly difficult time with the mandates, right? Many of us have differing opinions on mask or no mask, Vaccine or no vaccine. Just this last week, we filmed a podcast at River Valley. It's called Digging Deeper. If you don't listen to it, I suggest you do. It's really good. Tim's the host of it. He does a phenomenal job. He should be like a late night TV host. He's incredibly gifted. But in this podcast, the last two episodes, we've discussed essentially COVID. The first episode, we actually talked with a doctor and we discussed the medical stuff. And then the second episode, it was me, Tim, Tyler, and Pastor Mark, and we discuss mandates and a few other things that are going on. And in the second episode, I shared something that I believe wholeheartedly, and I want to share it with you guys. I believe wholeheartedly that COVID is a spiritual warfare attack from the enemy. I believe that with all of my heart. Now, is it fake? No, it's not fake. It's definitely real. But even more important and even more deadly than everything on the surface is what COVID is doing to the body of Christ. 
is what COVID mandates, masking, is what it's doing to God's church. It is causing disunity and distraction. And let me tell you something, the enemy's really good. He's really, really good. You know, some people think that the enemy's dream would be to get the world full of Satanists. Man, if, if, if the devils could just turn the world full of a bunch of Satanists, if they could make everybody a bunch of atheists, that's the best thing for them to do. That's how they would be really winning. That's top shelf strategy. No, 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 no. That's completely wrong. I'll tell you what the top shelf strategy for the enemy against God's church is. The top shelf strategy is to use distraction. It's to use distraction as a weapon. This is something that C.S. Lewis talks about in depth in his book, The Screwtape Letters. I, I, I reference Screwtape Letters about every two months here, okay? So if you haven't read it, you, you got to. I have a copy. I will loan it to you. It's an incredibly good book. You buy it on Amazon for like eight bucks. It's an incredibly good book. But in this book, what's happening is C.S. Lewis is basically writing a series of letters from one varsity-level demon to a demon in training. The demon in training is trying to tempt another person. And... The demon that's writing to him is basically giving these suggestions to the younger demon. It's all about how to tempt people from a demon's perspective. Well, in this book, the varsity level demon tells the younger demon this. He says this, this is incredible. He says, you will find that anything or nothing is sufficient to attract his wandering attention. You no longer need a good book, which he really likes, to keep him from his prayers or work or his sleep. A column of advertisements and yesterday's paper will do. Try to make him do nothing at all for long periods. Nothing is very strong, strong enough to steal away a man's best years, not in sweet sins, but in the dreary flickering of the mind over it knows not what and knows not why. It does not matter how small the sins are, provided that their cumulative effect is to edge the man away from the light out into the nothing. And then this is the verse that really smacks us in the face. The passage really smacks us in the face. He says this, Murder is no better than cards if cards can do the trick. That's fascinating. Murder is no better than cards if cards can do the trick. What's happening here? The varsity level demon is essentially saying, we don't necessarily need to annihilate and destroy people. All we have to do is set up distractions and that distraction will annihilate them. Just set up distractions, that's all you gotta do. Just set up little things. Just set up little things. Murder, murder, murder is just as good as cards. If you can get them playing cards, if you can get them distracted, we got them. We got them. As a church, we cannot be distracted from what God is calling us to do. The problem in Philippi was not theological, it was relational. And this relational problem was causing a divide in the church. I think if Paul was here today, if he was writing to us from Maryland or something, I think he would write us saying, do not let this distraction of mask or no mask, vax or no vax, mandate, no mandate, whatever, distract us from what God is calling us to do. I think he would say, we must stand firm. I think he would say, stand firm, just like he tells the church in Philippi. Stecco, remain strong. And I want us to notice something. You guys are gonna geek over this. I'm telling you, you're a bunch of nerds. You're gonna love this. He says this in verse three. He says, yes, I also ask you, true partner, to help these women. There's a few things in verse three that I want us to notice. The first thing is at the beginning of verse three, Paul is singling somebody out. He's saying, you, my true partner. Now, who is this person? Who is the true partner that he is pointing to? Some scholars think that it's Luke. Remember Dr. Luke? Some people think that it might be Clement. Some people think that it might be um, Epaphroditus. I don't really buy that one because Epaphroditus was with Paul. And so why would he write to the church in Philippi? He just said, just say it. So I don't really think it was Epaphroditus. But nonetheless, what Paul is saying here is he's singling out a leader in the church of Philippi, a true partner, and saying, you gotta help these women. You gotta get this under control. They're causing a relational rift in the church and it needs to get handled. When conflict and disagreement happen in the church, it hurts the body of Christ. And there comes a time when leadership has got to get involved. That's the first thing I want us to notice. 
There comes a time when leaders, pastors, bishops, whatever you want to call them, have got to get involved. The second thing that I want us to learn from this verse is what he says at the end. He says, along with Clement and the rest of my co-workers whose names are in the book of life. When Paul says co-workers, he's using a pretty cool Greek word. It's the word sunergos, sunergos. And what it literally means is someone that you are collaborating with. It means someone that you are working with, someone who has the same mindset as you, someone who's going in the same direction. So what Paul is doing here is pointing out to leadership in Philippi, stay with me, saying, hey, this is a problem in the church, gotta get your act together. But then he zooms out and he looks at the church itself and he says, fellow Christians, this conflict, this disunity, this problem, It's also on you. It's also on the church. Or in other words, what he's saying is that every single one of us in this room, if you are a Christian, has a responsibility to fight for Christian unity. Do you hear that? Every single one of us has to fight. We have to stick O for Christian unity. When you go on Facebook, when you go on social media, when you hear conversations taking place, there's a lot of friendly fire coming from the Christian community towards other Christians. A lot of friendly fire, especially about COVID. I think one of the reasons that we are seeing the church be so divided right now, I think, I think there's two main things, two main things that have led to this problem. Number one, it's bad leadership. It's bad leadership. It's Christian leaders who have taken a back seat and not had difficult discussions and conversations, not being willing to say the hard things, not being willing to stand up for Jesus when everything is going the other direction. I think that's one reason we're seeing a real problem in the unity of the Christian church. It's bad leadership. And then number two, distracted Christians. Distracted Christians. We're playing cards. We're getting distracted by these things that are tripping us up. Every single one of us has a responsibility to fight for unity. Now, some of you are saying, okay, Austin, I get that. Does that mean I have to agree with everybody on everything? No. No, does not mean that. If you listen to our podcast the last two times, like I said, it was, uh, the first one was Tyler, Dr. Williams, Tim, and myself. Um, in that podcast, I'm sure that you can tell that there was a lot of disagreement on both sides. There was a lot of discussion from one side and the other side, right? I don't agree with this. I do agree with that. I don't agree with this. The second podcast, same thing. I agree with you here. I don't agree with you there. I think that's a stretch. I think that doesn't make sense. All that kind of stuff. We disagreed with each other. But do you want to know what didn't happen after both of those podcast episodes? Here's what didn't happen. River Valley Rogue River did not become Third Street Bible Church Rogue River. It did not become Broadway Christian Church. Want to know why it didn't become Broadway Christian Church? Because at the end of those kind of discussions where I disagree with someone on COVID or they disagree with me, I can still put my hand around them and say, we're brothers in the faith, we're standing firm in the Lord, we're not gonna be budged, we're unified as brothers in the faith, and we're gonna continue to push back evil and tell people about the love of Jesus. And we can do that together. We don't have to separate about this. We can agree to disagree agreeably. And that takes maturity. But that's what we gotta be striving for. Unity. Unity. We're together together. So now that we understand that there is a problem of Christian conflict, I now want to kind of get really nitty gritty. I want to get into the, into the weeds, I guess you could say. I want to get very particular. I want to give us some practical solutions on how to deal with conflict with Christians in your own life, okay? So maybe some of you are dealing with some things right now. Maybe it's a friend, a loved one, a family member, whatever it is, and you're going through some conflict with them. They're a fellow Christian. You're saying, how do I handle this? Good news, you're in the right place. 401 Broadway Street, I'm pumped you're here because that's what we're going to talk about right now. So how do we deal with conflict with Christians? The first thing we must do is, number one, keep the conflict confidential and private. Number one, keep the conflict confidential 
and private. And when I say confidential and private, here's what I mean. I think there is great wisdom in having people in our lives that we can bounce ideas and thoughts off of. I think it's very good to have wise counsel that we can say, hey, brother, hey, sister, I need some help with this. I'm dealing with something right now, and I would love to hear your perspective on what's going on. I think that's very wise. Proverbs 13, 10 says, where there is strife, there is pride, but wisdom is found in those who take advice. Having people that we can confide in and bounce situations off of is incredibly important. But here's the thing, and I I can't stress this enough. The person that we confide in, we must make sure that that person understands the importance of confidentiality. I cannot stress that enough. I'll tell you in my own life. When I meet with someone whom uh, I trust, someone that, I, that I'm confiding in, someone who I'm asking their opinion for, if, and maybe this is, I don't know, maybe I gotta work on this, but I kind of have a strike one policy. If I'm going to that person about something that I need serious help with, and then I hear that that person went and told another person, for me, strike one and you're out. I'm probably not gonna confide in that person again. And here's why I'm not. Because gossip destroys relationships. It absolutely destroys destroys relationships. And remember, we have to protect unity in the body. Now, I think it's very common for many of us that when we disagree with somebody, the natural inclination that we have is try to assemble the forces, right? We want to get people on our side. We want to feel justified. And so it'll look something like this. It'll be like, oh my goodness, did you see when he said that to me? That really hurt my feelings. Oh, I'm not, I'm not surprised by it. You should see the way he treats our coworker. It's absolutely insane. Oh my gosh, I've noticed that. Yeah, I've noticed the way that he talks and the way that they look down on each other. That just seems totally inappropriate. Oh yeah, I had a conversation with Kimberly and she said the same exact thing. It was absolutely out of line. And then what happens is boom, 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 boom. And then bam, we're gossiping. We're loading up in our back pocket and we're wielding that gossip as a sword to jab into that person's heart and go, you're a fool and I know it. It's gossip. It's causing problems. It's not honoring God. It's fracturing the body and it's causing increased issues. Proverbs 16, 28 says, a perverse person stirs up conflict and a gossip separates close friends. You wanna fracture relationships with people? Gossip about them. You wanna destroy trust? Gossip about them. You wanna fracture relationships? Gossip about them. It'll ruin relationships. It'll ruin relationships. So when it comes to Christian conflict, number one, keep the conflict confidential and private. Now, if this initial discussion does not work, we move on to step two, which is number two. Take fellow Christians with you. Jesus says in Matthew chapter 18 that if the initial interaction with that person, the initial confrontation with that person doesn't work, then take a second or a third person and go and talk with them. Now, I don't know why this works, and maybe some of you can help, you can teach me this. I don't know what it is, but it almost appears that God knows human nature really well, (laughs) right? Like Jesus had a good grasp on human nature, because I don't know what it is. But for me, there have been many different parents, or even like wives, who will come up and say, hey, Austin, I would love it if you would talk to my husband about this. And I'm like, oh, really? And they're like, I've been talking to him about it nonstop, but I just can't get through to him. Or Austin, I have this son and he's doing this and I just can't get through to him. Would you mind talking with him? And I'm like, I don't know, who the heck am I? I'll give it a whirl. I'm sort of, yeah, sure, whatever. I'll go talk with him. And for whatever reason, sometimes by God's grace, that works. You see, I think there's something very powerful in having a different perspective when it comes to confrontation and conflict. I don't know what it is. I think there's something inside of us that just receives those tough conversations from other people with a different outlook that maybe just softens our heart to a point of humility. I don't know what it is, but, but it just it seems to work. And it's interesting that Jesus says, hey, bring two or three people because that can make all the difference. It can cause that person to have a little bit more clarity and a little bit more harmony and a little bit more humility. So how do we deal with Christian conflict, conflict with Christians? Number one, keep the conflict 
confidential and private. And number two, take fellow Christians with you. And then number three, remain humble and teachable. I think this is overarching, not just with conflict with fellow Christians, but in conflict with everyone. We must remain humble and teachable. When it comes to confrontation, it can be very easy to place blame and point the finger at someone and say, the problem is 100% with you and about 0% to do with me. Maybe about 0.01% because I'm living and breathing, but pretty much everything else, it's on you because you're a scumbag. The problem's you, it's not me. And while that might feel good to point and poke at other people, the reality is, is that when we are humble and when we are teachable, it can take the temperature in the room from about 1,000 degrees down to about 15 Proverbs 11, 2 says, when pride comes, then comes disgrace, but with humility comes wisdom. When I was 19, I had a mentor in my life who told me that every critic can be a coach. Every critic can be a coach, but the only way that critics can turn into coaches is if we remain humble and if we remain teachable. When I was 18, very first time I ever taught a sermon in front of a large group of people. I don't think I've ever shared this story with anybody, with, the, with a group of people. I was incredibly nervous. It was downtown. There's a lot of people. It was a Saturday night, a few hundred people in the crowd. My legs were shaking. My voice was super wobbly. I couldn't, like, it, it, my brain was foggy. I was so incredibly nervous to get up there and teach. I get up there and I teach, and I felt really good about it, guys. I felt like, man, I just knocked this out of the park. This is incredible. I've listened back in the past. It was garbage. I rec- don't listen to it. It sucked. It absolutely sucked. But I thought after the service that, man, this is, this is, this is really going to change someone's life. In fact, um, in the second row on the back, there was a guy the entire time. He was a little bit older gentleman, and he had this yellow think pad, and he was writing furious notes the entire time. And I'm like, oh, that's, God's using something right now because this guy's really, he's learning a lot. Praise the Lord, I'm here. So I walk off. This guy makes a beeline for me, makes it up the center aisle. Big smile on my face. Happy to meet this guy. I'm so glad I could teach you something, pal. This guy proceeds for about the next 10 minutes to tell me everything that I did wrong. And on his yellow pad, it was everything that I did wrong. And one thing, I'll never forget this. He told me, he said, I don't believe a word that you said up there. And the reason he said I didn't believe a word that you said is because I took a Dale Carnegie public speaking class many years ago. And in that class, it said that if you have your hands in your pocket, it means that you're hiding something and not telling the truth. And you had your hands in your pocket during a majority of the sermon. And because of that, I don't believe a word you said. I was like, oh, dang. This is wild, man. And I remember I was like, I was 18. I was, you know, a little hot tempered. And I remember saying some things that probably weren't great. And the situation definitely did not end well, and we went our separate ways. Later on, a mentor told me, turn every critic into a coach. And I'm thinking to myself, what did I learn from that situation? Did I learn that I need to not have my hands in my pockets? Here I am. (laughs) Did I learn that I need to change this about me or change that about me? No, no, no. Here's what I learned. Here's what I learned in that situation. I learned how to deal with difficult people. You see, the only way we can turn critics into a coach is if we remain humble and teachable and have the wherewithal to be able to say, what can I learn from this person? It may be unflattering. It may be uncomfortable. But we can turn critics into coaches if we remain humble and teachable. And that makes us better. That makes us grow. That makes us more mature. That makes us wiser. So how do we deal with Christian conflict? Well, number one, keep the conflict private and confidential. Number two, take fellow Christians with you. And then number three, remain humble and remain teachable. Let's continue in verse four and five and let's see how Paul wraps up this section. Here's what he says. Yeah, because I'm already over. So here we go, verse four. Rejoice in the Lord always. I will say it again, rejoice. Let's pause here. That's a cool verse. Look at that. Rejoice. What does rejoice mean? Rejoice is very simple. Have joy, but keep doing it. That's, it. that's what it is. You know, it's like rewind. Let's rewind and watch it back. Rejoice. Keep being joyful. Rejoice, rejoice. But then he's like, just for good measure, um, I'll say it again. Rejoice. That dude's a double rejoicing. 
He's so happy. He's rejoicing so much. And I love that Paul points out that joyfulness in the Lord is possible even in the midst of conflict. Isn't that cool? He's like, yeah, I get it. Conflict is tough right now. I get it. It's hard. But guess what? Good news. You can still remain joyful. You can still have access to God's joy. Verse five, he says, let your graciousness be known to everyone. The Lord is near. The Lord is near. When we read that, we might think, okay, what Paul's referencing here is the second coming of Christ, maybe the return of King Jesus. But that's not really what Paul's referencing. When Paul says the Lord is near, what he is doing is reminding the church that God is close to them, that God is near them. He's saying, I get it. Iodia and Syntyche are causing some rifts in the church. I get that conflict is difficult. I get that disagreeing with people can be incredibly hard. But don't forget that God is near. Don't forget that he's with you. Don't forget that he's with you in the valley lows and the mountain highs. Don't forget that he's not just with you in the low moments and the high moments, but actually he's tabernacling and living inside of you. He's with you every moment of every single day. Keep that in mind. Now, we don't know what happened with Yodia. We don't know what happened with Syntyche. We don't know if they were reconciled together and if they became best friends and met up for tea every Tuesday for the rest of their lives. We have no idea. We don't know what happened, but here's what we do know. And I think you guys are going to like this. I sort of geeked out this week. This is really cool. I found a letter that was written from a church father named Ignatius. Ignatius wrote a letter to the church in Philippi that we have a copy of. It was written in 108 AD. And in that letter, Ignatius was writing to the church in Philippi, and he was commending them on their unity. Isn't that cool? He was commending them on how they were unified together. And he even makes a reference in his letter about how Philippi was a model church for places such as Ephesus and Antioch. And that's pretty important because during this time in history, Philippi, particularly Philippi, was going through a lot of persecution. There were a lot of problems over happening in Philippi. Geographically, where Philippi was located was kind of a hot spot for a lot of wars and fighting going on. But it appears that Philippi remain unified. It appears that the church leaders and the church attenders, they got their act together. It appears that they fought for togetherness. It appears that they remain strong in the midst of everything going on. And you know, I was thinking about this and I was like, okay, so this happened back in 108 AD. It's 2021. I wonder if in 100 years, if Christians are still around here today, Lord Jesus, please take us soon. But if we're still here in another 100 years, Christians are still here. I wonder if in church textbooks and in church history, they'll look back at 2020 and say, remember everything that went down with the church at that time? They were unified. The Christian community, they remain strong. Like, I, I, wonder, I wonder what they'll think about us. I wonder what they'll think about the Christians today. I wonder if they'll pull up old tweets and old comments and old things and be able to go, oh man, that was a lot of nastiness. They were definitely not unified. Or I wonder if they'll be able to look at us and say, man, the Christian community, they really went through a lot of conflict, a lot of disagreement, but at the foundation of everything was that they were Christians on the same team following after King Jesus. I hope that they'll be able to say that. I hope that they'll be able to say the Christian community didn't run away from hard conversations. They didn't run away from conflict. They embraced it. They stood firm, stecco, in the Lord. They stood up for truth. They loved people in a Christ-like way, and they fought for unity. I hope they think that about us, but the reality is that the only way that that will ever come to fruition is if we take responsibility for ourselves and live a lifestyle of fighting for unity in the body. Does this mean I have to agree with every single one of you on every different thing? Absolutely not. But what this does mean is that we cannot be separated by trivial relational things that separate and divide the body. We can't let that happen. We can't let that happen. We have to fight for unity. We have to fight for unity. And the only way that happens is if we pursue unity in our own lives. And so guys, as a church here in Rogue River, as I was thinking and praying about this lesson yesterday, I was like, Lord, what can we do? What can we, what can we do to, to, to fight for unity? What can we do to just be a church that is, that is joyful? And I just keep coming back to this. Like, we have to pray about it. 
Like, like we have to spend as much time praying as we do arguing and thinking up counterarguments. Going before the Lord and saying, God, this is a wild time. This is a difficult time, but we need you. We need you to give us wisdom. We need you to give us clarity because Lord knows we don't know what to do. So that's what I want to do right now. I want to pray for us. I want to pray for our church. I want to pray for our leaders. And I want to pray that we will uh, remain unified during this crazy, crazy season. So let's pray. Father, Lord, this reality of what is happening just in our own state and the reality that many, many, many people in this church in, inside and outside and online are facing the reality of losing their jobs here in a little bit if they don't um, comply or do certain things that the government wants them to. Father, I ask that regardless of whatever is going on, Lord, that as a church we would remain unified and we wouldn't cast wicked words and slanderous thoughts towards people that we might disagree with. God, I pray that as a people, Lord, here in Rogue River, Lord, particularly, I pray that when people visit this church, that when they come to see River Valley, Rogue River for the first time, God, I pray that it would be a place and a community that really does resemble joyfulness. God, I pray that when we walk away, that when we miss a Sunday, we would have that same feeling that Paul had in Philippians 4, verse 1, that longing, that desire to come back and be with God's people. God, I just pray for joyfulness. I pray that we would be a people who are rejoicing, and again, I will say it, rejoice, Lord. Pray that we would constantly have that disposition of being able to rejoice in the midst of conflict and confrontation. Lord, thank you that you are near to us, and thank you that you have not abandoned us. Father, we love you so much. And again, we pray a special prayer over the people here today who are dealing with um, the very likely reality of losing a job, taking a pay cut, or whatever it might be. God, we pray for them, give them clarity, and give them discernment during this time. We love you so much, Jesus, and we pray these things in your name. Amen.